overcome by your presence, Lord. Whenever we have calamities, whenever we have issues, we fall on our face before God because that's our only peace and that's what we need. A few weeks ago, we started a series called Questions and Answers. And overwhelmingly, the questions that were brought to me had a main theme through some of those questions, and that theme is death. What happens? What happens when I die? What happens when somebody doesn't go to church and they pass? Or what happens when they rebel against God and they pass? Maybe what happens when a good person passes and, you know, those questions can be overwhelming. And the anxiety and the fears of the unknown in our minds and our hearts, those fears can captivate us. So what happens when we die? What happens? In John chapter 14, verse 14, Job, I'm sorry, Job chapter 14, verse 14, he asks a simple question. If a man dies, will he live again? If a man dies, will he live again? One of the Bible's greatest forms of communication is by questions. Cain asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? Moses, who is, the Lord, who is on the Lord's side? For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. David, a young man getting ready to fight Goliath, said, is there not a cause? Malachi, talking about giving. Will a man rob God? James says, what is your life? It is here for a second, but it's like a vapor, and it vanishes away. And Jesus even asked the question, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his own soul? But one of the greatest questions that we all have is this, what happens after we die? What happens? Is there life after we die? What happens when we die? If we die, is that it? We are simply absorbed into the cosmos? What lies beyond the grave? Is there life after death? Death and dying are inevitable. It's a part of human life. It is said that 100% of us one day will pass. But not all of us will be prepared for that day. So, when I looked at that, I started thinking about answering some of these questions. And, and this sometimes could be a very difficult topic. Because here's the situation. We all know somebody, whether it's a family member or whether it's a friend that has passed. We've all been at somebody's funeral where it's very awkward because there is no spiritual background. There's no heritage of spirituality. And there's hope. There's hope that there's heaven. But there's no proof that there isn't heaven. So what do we do with that? So sometimes we can, we can kind of figure out and we can all make our own mythology or our own spirituality. That's what many people have done. Let me list a few of them for you. Reincarnation is the belief that you've lived many previous lives. And after you die, you will return into another form. If you've lived a good life, you can come back as a higher life form. But if you haven't, you will be reborn into a lower form of life. Soul sleep. Soul sleep is the idea that after death, your soul sleeps until the final resurrection. The soul is said to hibernate until the resurrection when it's then awakened and reunited to its body. A belief held by the Jehovah, Jehovah Witness. Universal immortality. God is good all the time. And he won't condemn anyone. Universalism is the belief that all people will universally be restored after they die. In other words, it teaches that everyone, regardless of how they have lived their lives on earth, will eventually be, end up redeemed and in heaven. Mormonism teaches that we either go to a spiritual world or a place called paradise. People who received the gospel and were baptized into Christ's church by someone having the authority to do life and go to the paradise to wait to be judged according to the work and its deeds and life and rejoined to the resurrected new bodies. If you didn't have the opportunity to accept the gospel in this life, you'll have an opportunity to learn more about it in the spiritual world 
and will have an opportunity to accept if there was a waiting to be resurrected. Thanks to the Savior, Jesus Christ, he will all live again. That's what different religions say. But you know what? I don't really care what different religions say. There's two points that I really care about. What does the Bible say and what did Jesus say? And if we could take those two points of what the Bible says and what Jesus said, then we can take those points and we can hold on to those points and we can understand what death is all about. Death. It's wicked. There's no more sadness than when you have to deal with death. Somebody that you love, that you lay to rest. Somebody that you spent your life with, that you've laid to rest. The overwhelming sadness that compels us and the hope that motivates us. But hope is the thing that we have. If we have no hope, we are all men most miserable. You can look at anything that you have. You can look at your job. You can look at your kids. You can look at your finances. You're saying, I hope I can deal with this. I hope I can get out of this slump. If only tomorrow we'll get here, I can wake up and it'll be okay. Hope is a motivator. But there'll be a day when some people have no hope. There'll be a day that their internal separation from God will overwhelm us. Jesus gives us a wonderful story, a glimpse into hell. And in that glimpse into hell, he is talking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees of the day were the, the religious leaders of the day. They had the resources. They were the higher income people of Judaism. And they were talking about, look at me, follow after me, do what I tell you to do, and you'll be okay. And Jesus comes onto the scene. He said, it's not about following a man. It's about following after God. And if you follow after man, if you put all your stock into what man says, follow after a priest, then you're losing the point of what Christ has for you. And he, 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 he's confronting the Pharisees. Instead of us applying what the Scripture says in our society, what I want to do today, I want to take us into their society, into their culture. Because Jesus was confronting the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and all of the religious people followed after Judaism, followed after the Pharisees. Jesus said, listen, if you follow after man-made religion, you are just as guilty as the person that made that man-made religion. I want to give to you a story. I want to give to you a story, and I want you to take it to heart. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the Bible combined. Jesus is concerned. He came to redeem mankind from their sins. Even the word saved. You know what you're saved from? You're saved from your sins that will send you to hell. When somebody says, I am saved. In other words, I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And when I die, I have access to heaven. And I do not have to pay the penalty of my sins, which is hell. That's what we do. So let me look at... Um, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 26. Now, many of you have read this. You've heard many sermons on Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 26. But I want you to do something. Do not put your heart and your mind on coast mode. Don't do it. You say, oh, I know the story. I've I preached the message. I've lived the life. And as soon as you hear this story, you say, oh, you know what? I could, I could do more with this than you could ever think about doing it. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to focus. I don't want you to dream. I don't want you to think. I want to answer some questions. And there's people in here that have this burning desire for these questions to be answered. Luke 16, verses 19 through 26. There was a certain man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. In other words, he was rich. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died 
and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, the place where Abraham was, close to Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted in the torments. And besides all this, get this point, besides all this, between us there is a great gulf, what's the word? Fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. There's a great gulf fixed. I want to give you some contrast before we get into some points. The poor man became rich, and the rich man became poor. There's a poor man on the outside, and a rich man on the inside. And then there's a poor man on the inside, and a rich man on the outside. There's a rich man with food, and a poor man with no food. Then there's a poor man at a feast, and a rich man who cannot even find a drop of water. There's a poor man with immense needs and a rich man had no needs. Then there's a poor man with all of his needs met and a rich man with great needs. There's a poor man who desires everything and a rich man who desired nothing because he had everything. Then, there was a re then it was a reverse. The poor man desired nothing and the rich man desired everything. There's a poor man who suffered with the rich man who was satisfied and there was a rich man who suffered and then the poor man who was satisfied. There's a poor man who was humiliated and the rich man that was honored. Then there's a poor man that was honored and a rich man that was humiliated. The poor man who wants a crumb and the rich man had a feast and then the poor man had the feast and the rich man wants a crumb. There's a poor man who seeks help and the rich man who gives none. Then there was a rich man that sought after Lazarus, but could not give him none. The contrast. It makes no difference what we have. It makes no difference if you're rich and you dress like a million bucks. If you wear a suit and tie every day and you have thousands and even millions of dollars in the bank. You cannot trust in what you have. This rich man had everything. He feasted lavishly every day. He dressed like a million dollars every day. And just because you have resources doesn't mean you gain access to heaven. In that culture, in Jesus' culture, it was perceived that if you had money, if you had resources, if you were wealthy, God has blessed you. It was also perceived that if you had nothing, the Bible says they came and laid Lazarus at his gate. The family brought him laid him at the gate, asked him to beg, and he just longed even for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Let me give you the culture. The culture is they didn't have napkins. They used bread, and they would eat with their hands, and they would eat, and they would use bread to wipe the oil off of their hands. It was their napkin if they would. And then they would take that bread after they wiped their hands with the oil and they would just throw it under the table and the dogs of the day would come and they would lick up the bread that was underneath the table of the rich man he cared more about the dogs being fed than he cared about a person that was in need that's as low as you get Lazarus was as low in the culture as you possibly could get and the rich man was as high as you possibly could get in the culture but not in Jesus' eyes. Jesus looked at them and said, you are like this rich man. You have everything at your disposal. You eat well, you dress well, people honor you and they lift you up like you are the man. But there's gonna be a day that you are going to die. And he's looking at the Pharisees, and he says this. He says, one day they died. And the rich man, looking at the Pharisees now, said, the rich man, you 
opened your eyes in hell. But Lazarus was carried away into Abraham's bosom, the place of Abraham, the place of comfort. Even Lazarus didn't even have a burial. He didn't have a few, he was worthless. In the world's eyes, he had nothing. But in God's eyes, he was everything. But the man that was everything had the, had the funeral. Everybody came and mourned and told how great he was and how wonderful he was, how much good he did. But when he opened up his eyes in Hades, he was tormented. It makes no difference what you have. What makes a difference is who you have. The first point, there is eternal consciousness after death. Verse 23, and being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. There's consciousness. We are aware of our surroundings. It is said that I will go to hell and be with my friends. I parted with them on earth. I'm going to die with them in hell. The Bible says being in, what's the word? Torment. Being in torment. He lifted up his eyes, seen Lazarus. The one that was nothing was comforted, and the one that had everything was tormented. Listen to what D.L. Moody said, long-term preacher of old. Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody has passed from East Northfield, and he's dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher. That is, out of this old clay tent into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto a glorious body. I was born in the flesh in 1837, and I was born in the spirit in 1856. That which is born in the flesh may die. That which is born in the spirit will live forever. Once we give our life to Christ, we will live in the spirit forever. There is no doubt. The eternal consciousness, they were aware. And the second thing, one retains our individuality after we die. In verse 24, but Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. After death, Lazarus was still Lazarus, and the rich man was still rich man. But the rich man wasn't rich, and Lazarus wasn't poor. What you have does not define who you are. You can be rich or you can be poor. In life, Lazarus had evil things. In other words, junk happened to him. He had a bad life, but he did not allow his bad life to determine his eternal destination. But sometimes when we have, we allow what we have to determine our destination. We want what we want. We want more wealth. We want more popularity. We want what we want. And we say no to God. We say no to Jesus because that's going to interfere with what I want, my will. And we have to realize we are the same people in the Spirit, not what we have, but we retain our individuality after death. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. You will still be you after you die. The Bible says that in the place of consciousness and memory where you should, you should come to Christ. You will remember your opportunities you avoid and going on to suffering that you will experience. When I was a sophomore in Bible college, I came home for a summer, and uh, we had to come home to work and uh, to make money so we could pay for the next semester of college, and I worked at the park department, and uh, I was made up the baseball diamonds and mowed the fields and, and uh, just took care of the park and the, and the baseball diamonds. I had a buddy that worked with me. His name was Kelly, and Kelly was an all-state wrestler in high school. Three years, 
state championship wrestler. Kelly was a little stud. But Kelly had issues. And one day, Kelly and I were talking, and, and uh, Kelly started drinking, and Kelly was in a major funk within his life. His, his girlfriend just broke up with him, and he was going through some major issues. And, and uh, I could tell he was depressed. And, and here I was. I, I, I was a Bible college student, and I, I tried to say, okay, let, let me try something new. I mean, Kelly and I used to party together. We used to do all kinds of stupid things together. Now, now I'm a born-again believer, and I left that lifestyle, and I tried to go to Bible college. And, and now I was confronted with, what do I do with what I know? Do I party with him to make him feel good, or do I talk to him to have his life be better? So that night, I went to his house, and I started talking to him about what God can do and how he can forgive and how he can move on. And Kelly, I remember to this words, said, get out. Bruce, I like you, but I don't want to listen to your junk. I said, come on, Kelly, let's just talk a little bit. He goes, no. He said, if you think that's all our friendship is, is you preaching to me because you got saved and you went to Bible college, I could care less about your junk. And I said, Kelly, come on, dude. He didn't. I left. He came back to work the next day and there was no change. He didn't even talk about it. It was like it, was like it didn't take place. I went back to Bible college. I got a phone call from my mom. That two months after I talked to Kelly, they found him in his garage hung. He killed himself. Not knowing Christ, rejecting him at every turn. Now, he may have known him after two months after I left. I don't know that. But after the time I knew him and I talked to him, he rejected him. Do I have remorse about that? Yeah. Do I know what's taking place with Kelly? If he didn't know Christ? Yeah. Does it eat me up? I wish I was more persistent. I wish I'd have jumped on him even harder. I wish I'd have talked to him and been, you know, you need to do this, you need to do this. But you know what? We can talk to our family, we can talk to our friends until we're blue in the face. It is an individual choice that people have to make whether they want Jesus Christ or not. But the eternal damnation for us, for them that do not know Christ, is separation from God. And it gives me the C point. You will either spend eternity in suffering or in comfort. You will spend eternity in suffering or comfort. A recent poll reveals that 89% of Americans believe in heaven, while 73 believe in hell. When asked whether they think they will die, three or four think that they will go to heaven when they die, and only 2% believe they will end up in hell. 2%. You know, hell is full of people that think that they're okay. You know the most popular misconception about whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell is am I good or am I bad? Do I do enough good and if I do enough good I'm safe because God loves me and God's going to take care of me. If I do enough bad and the scale drops then maybe I'm not okay and that is from the deception of Satan. Because here's the deal. None of us are good, period. The Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is nobody righteous. No, not even one. And he said there's one righteous, and that righteousness is Jesus Christ. And when we give our life to Christ, we have been adopted into his family. And because we're adopted into his family, we gain access to heaven. Not because you're good, because he is good. Verse 23 through 25. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in these, what? Flames. Hell is a literal place of torment. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things 
and likewise Lazarus, his evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the people that thought they had everything, the people that used people to get what they wanted. And he said, in your lifetime, you have your popularity, your prestige, and your power. You have it. But look at these young guys that you fall at your feet. They even beg for you to help them. And you curse them. You laugh at them and you mock them. They're asking you for help and you will not give them any. One day, you had your rewards, you had your everything, and one day, you've received your good things in your mind. You've done everything that you want to do, but they have not received the popularity and the power like you have. They, the poor, they that love God, they one day will be with me in paradise. But see, you will either spend eternity in suffering or eternity in comfort. Not because of you think that you're good enough or not that you're bad enough. See, God loves us unconditionally whether you love him or not. The dividing factor is that God died for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And you can be the best person in the world. You can be the best dad, the best mother, the best parent. You can be the perfect teacher. You can do whatever you want. You can be great. You could have never sinned you could have never said a cuss word. You could never have smoked a cigarette or drank a beer. That doesn't change the fact that you're not good enough to go to heaven. We may think that it's good. We may think that we are good, but it's not good enough. What's good enough is admitting that I can't get to heaven on my own and admitting that Jesus needs to be my Lord and my Savior. And then your decision in life will determine your destiny in death. See, there's no way out. Once you're out, you're out. And once you're in, you're in. Verse 26, the most powerful verse of the story. And besides all of this, between us, between heaven and hell, there's a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can you from there pass to us. It's final. It's final. You don't get a purgatory experience. You don't get a second chance when you go into the spirit world. That's why it's so important that we pray. That's why it's so important that we live our life and we communicate. That's why evangelism is so, so important. Once in heaven, always in heaven. And once in hell, always in hell. No one can pass from one to the other. I like what Brian Tracy said. He said, it's a choice, not a chance, that determines your destination. It is not a choice. It is not a chance. It's our choice. And I remember in Acts chapter 24, the apostle Paul was talking to the governor Felix, and he was preaching to him and talking to him about heaven and hell, what Jesus did for him. And Felix was moved to trembling about what Paul was telling him. He knew it was the truth. And he knew that the only way that he was going to have access to God is to accept Jesus. But with trembling, he said, Paul, not right now. I have too much. I have too much to live for. I can't lose everything that I have. He said, Paul, I want you to leave. I will call you when there's a better opportunity for you to come back. In other words, when I am ready... I will call for you. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1, Boast not thyself for tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. You don't know what tomorrow has in store for you. But what you do know is what today is. Today is an opportunity for us to understand that when you're a child of God, when you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you're not going to be perfect but you can have salvation in Jesus. And when somebody closes their eyes and dies, it is sad. Oh, it's one of the saddest things that you'll ever experience. It's to the point where you have no hope because we know what the truth is. I started by telling you 
With hope, you can endure everything. But with no hope, you can't endure very long. When the rich man opened his eyes in Hades and seeing Lazarus afar off, he begged into Lazarus to go dip the tip of his finger into water and to put it on his tongue. And Abraham says, you can't. You can't. We can't pass from here to there or from there to here. He lost all hope. Eternity is a long time. And your torment is a long time. When we are motivated to serve him. Why are we motivated to talk to people about the Lord? Is because the eternal destination is in the balance. Our job is to talk to our family. Our job is to talk to our friends. Our job is to be the Christian that we can be in order to lead people to the Lord. So when they pass away, when we stand in front of this casket and we talk to them about Jesus and we talk to them about their life, we can give hope. Because without hope, there's nothing. Could you imagine eternity absent from God with no hope of ever getting out, no hope of ever being comforted, no hope? What do you live for? Well, you can't die because you made that choice. I want to answer another question. Someone gave me this question this morning. If someone I love doesn't make it to heaven, will I be sad and miss them when I get there? Great question. There's two parts to that question. Will you be sad now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know that they are in torment and you know that they didn't have a relationship with Jesus and knowing what the Bible says and what Jesus says there's one way to heaven and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ and if they did not accept that knowing the truth that there's eternal destination whether it's heaven or hell is there sadness here absolutely it should be our motivator that's why our Christianity is so real it's not about trying to get the blessings of God and what I can get from God that's pharisaical but when I says, you know what, what I want to do is I want to live my life so my kids can see Christ, so my family can see Christ, so my co-workers will see Christ, so when they pass away, I can say, I communicated to them. They gave me their testimony. I know that they love Jesus, but if they did not, what will take place when I go to heaven? Will I spend eternity in fear and sadness because I did not, or they did not accept Jesus. Well, I want to give you a scripture. This is not why you're on earth. This is after you pass. After the rapture takes place. It says this in Revelation chapter 21. Very comforting. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. When we enter into the presence of God, there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. And I know it's a misconception, but it is a very strong misconception. If there's no pain, and there's no sorrow, and there's no crying, that tells me that the people that passed before us that are in heaven, they are not watching us on this earth. Because if they in the perfect environment were watching us, in this sin-filled environment, there would be crying. There would be sadness. But they are in the presence of God. 
And they are in a barrier. We can't get to heaven. We can't get to hell from where we are. They can't come down to where we are. We are in the presence of God. And the Bible says, and God himself will wipe away every tear. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we gain heaven, we shall know them in heaven as they are. They shall be able to be recognized. But we are not going to be saddened when we get to heaven. Doesn't mean that we're not going to be saddened on this earth. The Bible promises 70 or 75 years. And in that 70 or 75 years, this carnal world is overwhelming us. And that's why we have to give our hearts and our lives to Christ. But when we take our last breath and we know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, 1 Corinthians says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord instantaneously. When we give our life to Christ and we know Jesus and we die on this earth, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Present. So when we know Christ, we gain heaven. And we do not know Christ. Unfortunately, we get the judgment of hell. One is the light of God. One is the absence of God. One is the light of the world. One is the absence of light at all. One is comfort and one is torment. One is agony and one is comfort. But here's the deal. Eternity. We're going to remember. We're going to remember what has taken place. We're going to remember. We're going to have a mind. We're going to have a body. Unfortunately, in heaven, it's a new body. It's a new spirit. We're going to be in a perfect environment with a perfect body. But if I can motivate you with one thing, it's a negative motivation. In hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. I want to say that here's what I believe hell is truly like. I hope none of us go there. I hope you give your life to Christ before you have to die. But let me tell you, I want to give you a motivator to talk to your family. I want to get a motivator to pray for your family because of this. Every anxiety, every sin, every pain, every addiction, every craving, every memory, every thought you have will stay with you for eternity. Every sermon you heard, every time that somebody talks about Jesus being the salvation of the world will be on your mind. You will know that all it took is for you to say yes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and you could have been saved in eternal bliss. But those that do not receive him will spend an eternity knowing and remembering and thinking about what God has said. There'll be a time, if you are here, there'll be a time that you're burning in torment. And your mind will say, I remember the day that I went to that church in Wichita and I heard a message on hell. And all I had to do is accept. And I would not be in these torments and I would not be in the absence of God. On this earth, I had a great life. Or even I had a bad life. But I had an opportunity to hear about Christ. And that is the peace that God wants to give to you today. That each and every one of us have the ability and have the access to salvation through Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity. If you've never given your life to Christ. If you've never been saved. A church term from Satan's family to God's family. From hell to heaven. From sin to to forgiveness. If you've never been saved, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity. It is not knowing everything. It's not doing anything physically. It's accepting what Jesus Christ has done for you. And just saying, I accept. I can't get to heaven on my own. I'm not trying to save you from hell. 
I'm trying to give you a savior for heaven. And when we have a savior, my sins are forgiven. My past is behind me. My future is secure. And I have something to look forward to. I know that when I die, I don't have to worry about my family. I don't have to worry about what people think of me. I don't have to worry about my destination. I want my family and my friends and my coworkers to know I am safe in the arms of Jesus. And when I pass, there's not going to be tears for me. There's going to be joy for me because I am in the presence of God. There's not a greater peace. There's not a greater hope. There's not a greater joy. Oh, there'll be sadness because of the loss, but not for eternity. Because in eternity, God will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no sickness. There will be no sadness. There will be no tears. We'll be in the presence of God, in the peace of God forever. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Bible says. If you want to accept Christ, if you want to have hope in eternity, it's in Jesus' hands. It's not in yours. All you have to do is I don't want to live my life for myself anymore. I want to give my life to Christ. Let him change me. Let him give to me a hope of eternity. If you would, please stand to your feet. Two parts. I want you to think personal. Have you given your life to Christ? Have you given your life to Christ and you know when you die that your eternity is in the arms of Christ and you're safe in the arms of Christ? I implore you. Today is the day. You don't know what tomorrow has in store. Today is the day that you give your life to Christ and let him forgive you and give you hope in eternity. But then, do you have a Kelly Bird in your life? Do you have one of the kids that I have in my life that I tried? I know that they're not a believer. And I want to my, do my best to communicate to them. At that time, many years ago, I was talking out of my pride of what I knew. I was telling him everything that I knew. You need to give your life to Christ. If you don't give your life to Christ, you'll never get to heaven. And I was telling him everything I knew up here. But I never talked to God about him before I talked to him about God. And there's times in our life that we need to say, by name, those individuals that need Jesus. Those individuals that God has put upon our sphere of influence that need Christ. And you need to talk to God and allow God to give you that divine moment of open opportunity to share what Jesus Christ has done for you to them. And then you will hear the sweetest words and you have the privilege of taking the Bible. Saying, I really don't know what the Bible says about everything. But this is the one thing I know. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I have hope. I once was in my sin, but now I'm forgiven. And I want to share with you that Jesus did that. And if we talk to God before we talk to them, they have an opportunity to talk to God with them. So let us pray. Let us seek God's face. If you've never given your life to Christ, let one of the deacons take the Bible and share with you what the Bible says about salvation. I would love to share that. That is the highest. The Bible says that Angels in heaven rejoice when one person comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because it has changed the entire eternity for that soul when they enter in the presence of God because of what takes place when somebody gives their heart and their life to Christ. And I believe Jesus smiles when his people have a compassionate, not like the religious leaders that would not give a crumb to the poor, I believe when we are a child of God and we have compassion and we want to give them whatever we have, it puts a smile on God's face because we love people. We care about people. And today we need to pray that God will use us to minister to them and God will bless us and God will break your heart and give your life to Christ to change your eternal destination.